Perfect. So giving keynotes is a really great thing because you have a whole day of content ahead of you. So that means I don't need the, actually need to answer any questions. Right? I will just raise a lot of questions and then you have you know, dozens of sessions which will go and help you answer those. So the title of my talk is, I made everything loosely coupled. Will my app fall apart? But I felt a little bit bad about saying this, so I will ask now, what will hold my app together? So I've been building connected systems or distributed systems or integrated systems for quite a long time. So what I wanna do is reflect a little bit and dig a little bit deeper what's really behind all these words that we tend to use so easily. Like what is an event? How is something event driven? Like who drives those events when you are event driven? And of course, my favorite topic of architecture. So the word that you cannot avoid when you talk about anything that's interconnected is the word, word coupling, right? We always like to build systems that are loosely coupled and a big driver behind the event-driven architectures is also to decouple systems. But there are a few things to keep in mind. The first thing is, you know, you don't want everything to be loosely coupled all the time. It's definitely handy to have some solid connections, like in this case, where you make sure you have a stable and tight connection. So loose coupling is a good heuristic, but it's not the end all be all goal. And the topic isn't new to us. So one of my favorite quotes around coupling is, well, how do you make systems ultimately loosely coupled? Well, the answer is easy, by not actually connecting them. And this gentleman, David Orchard, used to be the chief architect of BEA, so some of you might remember BEA. They were founded in 1995. So, and you know, WebLogic comes from there, so it's the hottest thing at the day, but that also tells us that the story of coupling and decoupling, well, it's at least a quarter century old. So let's see how all this plays out when we fast forward the technology that we have at hand, right? We have serverless, we have automation, we have cloud, we have NoSQL databases, we have streaming, we have all this cool stuff that we didn't have back then. But at the same time, yeah, we need to remember what we do with this technology and how we make architecture and design trade-offs. Now that's my sort of tiny soapbox I always need to get on before I get to the events and the driven and the architecture is, well, what does it actually mean to have an architectural view on this? So I'm, I'm an architect. My title is to be actually enterprise strategist. Still haven't quite figured out what that is, right? So I consider myself actually an architect. And I don't think architect is something that you have on the business card. I find architect is something that's much more a way of thinking. And the first thing or the first item that comes to mind when we think about what architects do is, well, architects draw pictures, right? And sometimes we sort of make a little bit of fun out of architects because they might be drawing too many pictures, but I actually find it very useful to draw pictures. However, there's different kind of pictures that we in IT tend to draw. So often when we think about architects, the pictures that come to mind are these giant tapestries, like these system landscapes, like these database schemas, these giant posters. And what you find is though that famous architects, like real building architects, they do not draw those kind of blueprints. They sketch. So I think for architects, it's very useful to be drawing, but you don't want to be drawing blueprints, you want to draw sketches. So he's a very famous architect, Oscar Niemeyer. He passed away a couple of years ago, and I think he turned to be 105 years old. So it must be a very healthy profession, so I encourage everybody to be an architect. And here's one of his well-known projects. It's the city of Brasilia in Brazil when they moved to the capital. And here's the sketch of the National Congress. Now you could say, I could have done that. And the blunt answer is no, probably you could not have because there's a lot of thought behind this. There's a lot of decisions behind this. And even though there's a ton of detail omitted, this simple sketch captures absolutely the essence of what they're gonna build. 
And if you're sort of saying, oh, but this is exactly sort of how the ivory tower starts, right? People making these kind of pictures that maybe don't have that much to do with reality, you can be assured that in the end, what was built looks almost exactly like the original sketch. And in the end, this has actually become sort of the logo for the National Congress because it's so recognizable because it has the core decisions in it. So yes, architects should draw pictures, and you'll see a lot of pictures in my talk, but they're not blueprint kind of things, they are sketches. The second thing that I consider architects to be very good at is that we can see more dimensions than some other folks might see. And I'm sure you've been in these kind of situations where people argue back and forth, right? People say like, oh, we need to cut the schedule or we need to deliver more features, but well, we need more time for testing, right? So people go back and forth and back and forth, right? How can we do this? And as an architect, you can see more dimensions in this. Maybe I can automate some pieces so I can achieve quality without compromising the timeline. Or people say, oh, I need more hardware, I need more performance, but I also need to save cost. And these people can argue over this forever. And as an architect, you say, oh, why don't we make the infrastructure elastic? Why don't we automate this? Why don't we make this serverless, right, if you like? So the architects, we can see that things are really sort of one or the other. And we can see that one person, you know, looking at this from a single point of view, no matter what you tell them, they will claim they see a circle. And the person looking from the other side, no matter what you tell them, they will claim to see a rectangle and they will never agree. So as an architect, you come in and tell people, look, you know what? Move a little bit left or right. You will see these are actually three dimensions. You're both looking at the same thing. This is, in fact, a cylinder. So it's something very valuable we do to get people out of this, you know, being stuck between left and right. The third thing that we as architects like to do, we like to look at things from different levels of abstractions. The sketches play an important role in this. And the amazing thing is that the systems we look at when we zoom in and zoom out, it's not like setting the photocopier to sort of 140% kind of thing, right? When you zoom in and zoom out, you tend to see very different things because our systems are fractal in nature. If I look at something in detail, I have very different considerations than when I look at a system as a whole. And we'll see this when we apply this all to event-driven architectures. And the last one, you know, very close to my heart, is that as architects, I find experienced architects rarely have absolute statements. Like, everything must be serverless, everything must be loosely coupled, everything has to be in containers, right? Sounds really good. You might think makes you sound smart, but it actually does rather the opposite. It makes you sound less smart, because architecture is the business of trade-offs. There's always shades of gray, there's always nuances. Anything you gain, you might be losing something else. You would find that experienced architects rarely come in with sort of predefined opinions, but rather they come in with mental models that help you find a good balance between the design criteria you are trying to fulfill. So that is a little bit of a frame, so what we're gonna use, so we're gonna use this way of thinking, right? We're gonna, we're gonna sketch, we're gonna see a bit more dimensions, we're gonna zoom in and zoom out, and we're also gonna see shades of gray as we look at event-driven architectures. So the sketches we like as architects, they generally consist of boxes and lines, right? Those are the most popular sketches that we have. And why are the lines so important? So that's my little pitch to the importance of the lines, because event-driven architectures are very much about the lines, not just the boxes. So here's a very simple picture I like to use. Very simple, two very simple systems, A, B, C, D. They use the same components, A, B, C, and D. Now, they're wired together differently, though. Right? This is more sort of a layered architecture, you could say a stack kind of thing, and the right-hand side looks different. Now, as an architect, the most important question I have is, are the characteristics of these systems different? Of course, it's kind of a catch question because the answer is 
Of course, they are very different. On the left-hand side, I have very clean dependencies, which makes it easy to replace a system with another one. I can take C out and put something else in. On the other hand, I might have longer latencies, and I could also have a single point of failure. If C isn't there, A cannot talk to D. The right-hand side is exactly the opposite. Right? I have more dependencies, so it's much harder to replace something, but I have short paths and I have resilience. And this tells you that just drawing the boxes does not actually express your architecture well. So I have a popular saying, which is architecture diagrams without lines are not actually architecture diagrams because the lines are the things that tell you about the essential properties of the system. And if you don't show those lines, I have no idea how your system is going to behave. So the way I sometimes summarize this is that architects are more like chefs. Having good ingredients helps, and you should get good ingredients, you know, we have some, but it's also about how you put them together. Yeah, just like you go to the restaurant because the chef cooks the thing nicely, you assume they buy high quality ingredients, but you like the food for how it's being put together. And absolutely the same thing is true for architects. Your architecture is not your bill of materials. Your architecture is how you put it together and why you put it together this way and the essential properties that you are looking to achieve when you put it together that way. Now, when we put things together, there's a lot of technologies you can use to do that. And you know, unsurprisingly, AWS has many of them. So one question that often comes is, well, what tool do I use when, right? So when should I be using something more like AppFlow, when I should be in serverless land with event bridge and step functions, sort of, when do I choose what? And often people look at the sort of technical characteristics, right? You look at what the service does and you look at sort of, does that match what I want to do? And then you find the right service. Careful though. Architects do see more dimensions. So when it's about choosing a tool or understanding what this line actually represents, you should be looking at some very different factors. And one factor is how much control do you have over the boxes? Because that makes a huge difference on how you're gonna draw the lines and which lines you can draw. Another important question is, well, who makes the connection? Is it the same folks who develop the boxes, or is it a different team, or a third party, or something different altogether? And the third important question is, when does this actually happen? Is this something that's done after the fact, where there's two existing boxes, and now you need to integrate them because you need to do something specific? Or are you building a distributed application where all this is happening at the same time, you have full control over the endpoints, and it's a single team? So none of this is right or wrong. These all have their purpose, but you need to understand the context in which you are drawing these lines. And that's the difference between Integrating, because integration is generally assumed to be sort of after the fact you have a little bit less control and you're likely a separate team, towards building distributed applications where the lines and the boxes sort of all come out of one hand. And that is very important to understand, and we'll come back to this, because this also impacts the level of coupling that you can afford. So the amazing thing about architecture is it's all shades of gray and often the decision is not made based on the technical product but based on the context in which the work takes place and the level of control you have over the various pieces. So now I made my pitch for the lines. So behold the line. The lines are very important. So let's zoom in and look more specifically at the lines. So my favorite architecture diagram, right? A does something with B. Well, how complicated can this possibly be and what could possibly go wrong? Now, I said I'm gonna ask more questions and give fewer answers, so I have actually a lot of questions on this. 
what's this interaction model? Is this like a method call? Is this an RPC? Is this messaging? Is this synchronous, asynchronous? Is this point to point? Um, actually, more importantly, is this the data or the control flow? This could be polling, like B could be polling. So B is controlling, but the data is flowing from left to right. I have no idea. Well, what is the data format? What is actually A and B? Is A a system or is it an instance of a particular system, right? What are these things even? And then it gets even more interesting. I'm building a perhaps distributed system, right? Now I have things like partial failure. What happens in errors? Can I retry? What happens if I do retry? Do I have item potency? What if I write, retry too much? I'm going to bring B down, so do I need to be backing off? So there is quite a bit behind that simple line. And as architects, we need to understand these things. Now I mentioned we dealing with this for at least a quarter century, but we made a lot of progress in the technology. The interesting part is some of these problems are inherent. You need to just deal with it. But other ones, the new technology can make, can make a lot easier for you to handle. But you should have all these considerations in mind when you draw this line. So that's the power of the simple sketch. The sketch is simple, but behind the sketch, there is a lot of detail. So I mentioned the dimensions. So I was meeting with a team in Melbourne just like two weeks ago, and they used a great product, actually from one of our sponsors, partners here, right? They were like, super happy with what they're using. And they made a statement roughly like this. So we, we are event-driven, so there you have it, EDA, and that decouples our teams and it pops up so we can work independently and asynchronous, right? And they sort of, you know, they were like really excited about the product they had used and it seemed to work well for them. And they're sort of spewing out a lot of interesting words, right? It's components, side effects, asynchronous, decouples, architecture, like sounds pretty good. As an architect though, the first thing I need to do is like, well, hey, whoa, my head hurts, right? That's a lot of stuff. But the next thing that my architect brain is gonna require is, we need to dissect these kind of things. Aha, so you have a certain interaction style. You using messaging as opposed to, let's say, RPC. You're doing this asynchronous, and that's the temporal, that's the time aspect of how this interaction works. And your publish subscribe is a choice about your composition model. If you have two listeners to something, they both get a copy of the message versus you know, having workers, worker pools and competing consumers. You're using events, so that is another important decision, and we'll dive deeper into this. Now you also believe you're event-driven, but I come back to, well, who actually makes you driven by the events? The events alone cannot do that. That is something the application has to do. And you're always assuming this is all distributed, which probably in the day of cloud it is, but also that is not taken for granted. So in the end, they were super happy with their technology choice, but they were a little bit sort of blurred in their mind what this technology choice all brought with it. So there might be some things here that they were absolutely after. There might be some things here they really wanted. And there might be other things that just sort of happened to come with the product, but that they didn't consider essential, right? Something that is ancillary to them. So one of my advice, and this is coming, yeah, I work for a vendor. We sell products, right? The advice I have is separate your architecture thinking from your product selection. There's many fantastic products, and I'll just put, put some up here, right? Whether this is your know, Kafka, or managed Kafka service, right? With this SNS, SQS, we have MQ, sort of more, um, you know, sort of RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ type managed services. They're all great, but they all come in sort of different bundles. And quite honestly, I made this table up so on the quick, so this is not sort of a, a, a sort of corporate piece of communication that you should use. This is more like for you to start thinking about what bundle of these properties comes in which product and which ones am I really after and which ones sort of just came with the product. And you can see that I put a question mark at event driven because the communication channel, your messaging product, is not the one that can really make you event-driven. Only your application 
can make you event driven. So making product decisions, I come back to the chef, right? Picking the ingredients, making product decisions is very important, but it's a separate activity from deciding your architecture and your architectural properties. And I highly encourage folks that when you think about your system, don't think about it just in your technology choice, make sure to think about it in the desirable properties that you want your system to have. And then the technology choice, right, that is just the incarnation of that. And it might not have all possible combinations. So you might get some things that you didn't need, that is really great. You might want some other things that you can have and then you pick a different product or you combine product. But it's true levels of consideration. So with that we come to Coupling, right? When we always say, as soon as we draw a line, the question is always, how thick is this line? Meaning, how tightly or loosely coupled are these two systems? Now, as an architect, I have sort of one habit. I don't like buzzwords very much. And I've written a whole 700-page book about essentially loose and tight coupling, so I have to, you know, sort of restrain myself and say, whenever I use one of these words, Let's think about what is actually behind it. Let's not spoo out buzzwords. Let's explain to people what they mean and what the considerations and the trade-offs are. So coupling is a measure of dependency or vice versa. It's a measure of independent variability. If something is loosely coupled, I can make a change over here or a change can happen and it doesn't propagate into a change on the other side. The connection can absorb this kind of change. Now this can be a design time or a runtime change. It can be a new feature or system B being replaced with something else or version upgrade or whatever it might be. It can also be a runtime change. It can be high latency, it can be failure, intermittent failure, right? It can also happen at runtime. Now I said it's all about shades of gray. So decoupling things is valuable, but it's not free. It has a cost, both at design and at runtime. And it's absolutely not black or white. It's not a binary thing. It has many dimensions. We talked about having multiple dimensions. So when I try to explain folks about why we as engineers talk so much about coupling and how we explain this, we have written a book called The Architect Elevator, right? How do we make this accessible to people at other levels in the organization? Right, we're making these decisions around coupling. They're very important. They carry a lot of weight and consequences. How do we get more people to understand how we're making the decisions and most importantly, the assumptions we're making when we do make those decisions? Because other folks in the organization might be able to either validate our assumptions or they might caution us that we're making assumptions that are not actually holding true. You know, loose coupling has something to do with change and change propagation. Well, who are the best people who can sort of predict what is likely to change or not change? Well, that is generally the business or the product folks because they have an idea of what they want to do later. So they are a critical input into this decision. So we need to be able to explain these things in simple terms. So we already learned, right, it's a measure of dependencies. How tight are those, right? And it brings me some benefit. It limits the change or it can limit a runtime error radius, right? When is this most useful? Well, it's most useful when I have less control and change is frequent. If nothing ever changes, I don't need to decouple very much. And I, if I have full control over the endpoints, I can also get away with more coupling because if the change propagates, well, I just change it on both sides, right? So there are times when this is more valuable and there's times when this is less valuable. So what we need to do is explain what these things are, translate them into benefits, so it limits the change radius for changes at design time, as well it limits the error radius if something goes on or it goes wrong at runtime. Now, those are still proxies. These are things that seem really good to us, but when you're talking to decision makers or to business people, they might say like, why is this so important? And that's where we often forget to make one more level of translation, right? 
Why do I want a limited change radio as well? In order to move faster and be able to accommodate more change. And as techies, we often say, well, that's totally obvious, right? Wouldn't you know this anyway? And the answer is no, it isn't. It's very easy for you to make that translation, but it might be very hard for a broader audience to make that association on its own. And limiting error radius, likewise, gets you more reliable and fault-tolerant operations. And then you need to balance this out, right? There's a cost for this, and the cost can be a dollar cost, but it can also be a complexity cost, right? There's just simply more moving parts in these loosely coupled systems. So I mentioned it's not a single dimension, so coupling has many nuances, right? People say like, oh, I did this one thing, now I'm loosely coupled. It's like, well, there could be, you could be doing a dozen different things that affect your coupling. Like, are you making, is this like JNI or something? Like, is this something that ties you to a virtual machine or even a programming language, right? How are you identifying B when you're talking to B? Is this a hard-coded IP address? Is this a DNS lookup? Yeah, is this a channel name, right? There's many, many different, what's the data format? Big, small, endian, right? How do you do with strings? Is null the same as empty? Is a missing field? Are fields optional, right? You can download this down this list down to the conversation, right? How do I fetch things repeatedly? I fetch some data set, now I want the next part of the data set. That is also part of coupling because both sides need to agree on how this works. You break down the buzzword into many different dimensions and seeing all these dimensions is really what helps you as an architect understand what we do after. So luckily, a friend of mine, Flat, he's writing a book about this coming out, I think in December or early next year, all about coupling and software design, not just event-driven systems. And he has a really nice mental model where he breaks this down. It's like, how strong is this coupling, right? Am I connecting, am I talking via messages so coupling is not as strong, or am I accessing the database field straight on the other side, right? That is more strength. The second one is, what is the distance between the two systems? If I'm building two parts of this in one application, maybe this kind of coupling doesn't bother me, right? Actually, one class writes something in the database, the other class reads something from the database. That's probably okay that they use the same field name. So the distance matters, and of course, the volatility matters. If nothing changes, I have no problem with coupling. Well, in our days, usually things do change a lot. So, recommend to have a look at this. I, I was able to, um, to read the script, super interesting book, so a yeah, little bit of patience required, but it allows me to make my talk a tiny bit shorter. So, a couple of things that are in here, but one I want to highlight is that there isn't a single answer to how loosely or tightly coupled you should be, and it's also not true that loosely coupled is always better. So one heuristic that I use is the more control I have over the endpoints, the more coupling I can get away with because I will need to make a change here and it necessitates a change over there. If I have CI, CD, I have everything in a source repository, I've automated tests, right? Maybe I have a refactoring ID, I have a lot of tools in my hand, the change propagation isn't that harmful to me. So rather than spewing out buzzwords or sort of chasing ideals, we should understand the trade-offs and have some richer heuristics about how do we come to a decision. So as we are zooming in, right, I, you know, architects zoom in and zoom out, so we gotta zoom in and talk a little bit about more events, right, because this, you know, we talked about coupling, we talked about lines and distributed systems and many things, so now it's about event-driven architectures, and obviously, they will have something to do with events. And there's an architecture that explains to us what events are. Events are messages, and messages are the interaction style. Now, this is out of my book from 2003, The Enterprise Integration Patterns, where messaging basically is sort of the simplest interaction style that you can imagine. You package all your data into a message, and you transport that data from A to B. For example, a procedure call is very different. A procedure call has a return address, return parameters, a call stack, right? Many other moving parts messaging does not have. So that is the 
baseline we're working off, and then events are a special kind of message. They use the messaging interaction model, meaning we package things and we move them from A to B as a, as a bundle, as a package, but we give it specific semantics. The thing that we're transporting now means something slightly different. And we can transport commands, right, system B do this. We can transport documents, right, here's a new order or a purchase. And we can also transport events. There's a really nice talk, an article from Martin Fowler from 2017, so it's like five years ago, where he has a really nice example of what he calls passive aggressive events. So those are things where you pretend to be an event, so let's say your new order came in, but you're tacitly assuming that the new order coming in leads to payment processing. Yeah, and Martin is better on stage and sort of he's like, hey, order came in, don't you want, you know, don't you want to process the payment? Because I kind of want to know that the payment processing was successful. And at this point, you sort of compromise the event because the event is a pure notification that something happens, and you cannot have expectations of what is coming back to you. And that shows the subtleties of these kind of architectures where you might name things like an event, but your system architecture makes assumptions that actually make it more like a command. And then you believe you build an event-driven architecture, but you actually did not. So that's about messages and events. The next thing that you need to do is, well, you need to connect systems somehow, right? Like how does A know it's talking to B? And generally we call this a channel. It's like an abstract way of describing what is this thing in the middle. And again, you have choices. There's nuances. You can name it after the destination. And you say, ooh, isn't that tightly coupled? I'm like, well, sometimes that's okay. If I know I want to talk to the payment processor, right? it's maybe not wrong to say like, here, please payment processor, do something. You can also name it after the kind of command. What are you looking to achieve and you're not assuming that the payment processor is necessarily the only thing that can do that. Now, you can take this one level further and say, well, maybe it's an object. Here's a purchase. So that's a business entity that you're passing along. Or you can do sort of the typical event thing, the order is placed, right? And this is either you talk to the system, you have more of a command, you have an entity or an event. Now, I'm always hard pressed to see why magically this makes you more loosely coupled. It kind of does, but it kind of doesn't. Because the two parties still need to agree, right? If it's event driven, the payment processor still needs to know that it's listening to orders placed and what format these orders come in. So you still have to have some sort of agreement. So to some extent, you're shifting the burden of who makes the connection from left to right. And that has some benefits. For example, if you have many listeners, it's better to do it on the right because that way the left-hand side doesn't need to know who all the listeners are. But it sort of doesn't magically disappear. You still need to forge this connection. So there's a lot of nuances here. Now the next thing is this channel, this like abstract construct of a channel, isn't necessarily sort of one thing that has a name. You can have many different ways of actually making this connection technically. So one way you can do is you can just create this channel, right? And this could be an S uh, yeah, SQS, CLQ, or an SNS topic, right? And then you just pass a reference to this to the two endpoints. So they might not even know what this thing is called. They're just like, oh, I'm getting events. I have no idea where it's coming from. But you have a composer who does know, right? So you're shifting the aspect of how do A and B find each other. You're shifting that to a separate component. You know, can be done. And I'll talk a bit more about this. Why in the cloud? That's often what we do. You can agree on the name, right? That's sort of the most obvious one. There's this channel, there's this queue, like a topic name, right? I subscribe to the topic. But often in pub subsystems, you will find that you're not subscribing to a single name. You have a hierarchy of topics. 
And you can actually do this, for example, in EventBridge. You have prefix matching on fields. So you can name topics as a sequence of things, and you say, I want to listen to all orders. I only want to listen to orders you know, in the EU. I only want to listen to orders in the UK, and I only want to listen to new orders or order updates in the UK. You can have these topic hierarchies, right? And you can totally do that. And if you want to take this yet one step further, you can also use fields, right? The third version is really just a special case of number four is, well, I filter or I root or I consume events based on the value of certain fields. Now, is four more loosely coupled than one? Well, in a way it is and in a way it isn't. I don't think there is sort of an easy answer to say, oh, everything should be like model four. Being able to compose a system has many advantages because you have one place where you know what talks to what. And that is super handy when you're debugging, for example, or when you're understanding your system structure. Yeah, number four is much more fluid, but also requires you to have much better handle on your runtime architecture because it might be not easy for you to find out who's actually going where. Now, I mentioned before, there's tools that help you do that, right? You can have X-ray and other things that trace your messages, but but these are trade-offs that you're making. Now, I like to look carefully at words, and one of the words we use lightly is sort of event-driven, right? I mentioned like, well, what, what is the driven part? How am I event-oriented versus when am I event-driven? Again, come back, very nice talk from Martin Fowler quite a good while ago, where he defined more precise terms. So one way you can use events is as a pure notification. I right, say so something happened, but the event doesn't actually carry all the state. The other party might actually go back to the source and say, okay, the address changed. Well, what is the address now? And you're like, ooh, coupling. On the other hand, no data duplication, no eventual consistency, single source of data has some advantages. What you can also do is you can transport the state with the message, right? Now you have more independence because your know, policy coding doesn't need to know, you know what customer management is. This is an insurance example, right? Some customer moved, right? So it has a copy of the data so it can scale independently, it can work locally, but you have data duplication and possible data drift, right? He, he gave this a bit of a funny name, the event carried state transfer, right? So you choose. The next one is what we often say is event source system. That is a completely different ballgame. What event source systems are is something that assumes that the sequence of events is sufficient to rebuild your system state. So it's no longer just about communicating and updates, but basically the state of your system sits in the sequence of Events. It's a little bit like a database with a log and checkpoints, but you're using that model for your application. And then for completeness sake, right, there's also CQRS, which is a little bit different, but often mentioned in this context of event-driven systems, where you say I have a very different view on making updates to my system versus actually reading from my system and making that separation. So once again, I said we like sketches, so here's four sketches that help you really you know, get into the nuances of these different systems. Next one is orchestration versus events, right? So we're gonna look at a lot of things. Yeah, we have some great orchestration tools. Many folks of, of our team are here, right, from Step Functions is there is a certain system image when you do orchestration. Orchestration implies that you have a central control. You keep the state of your system in one place. It has many advantages because it's very easy to know what is where and how long things take. And then the participants become more Passive, right? It's like, hey, do this, and then the orchestrator knows what's coming next. The pieces do not need to know what the sequence here is. So has some decoupling and some nice properties. But if you now say, I want to be more event-driven, right, with our favorite driven word, that becomes very different because now the events go straight from A to B through all the system, right? So, hey, here's a new order, here's a change address, here's a failed payment, here's a delivery exception, like all these events just go left, right, and center. So you no longer have a central entity that prescribes what happens in which order. 
The event subscriptions and the event publications do that together perhaps with event routing, something like event bridge. Now what you do in those cases, sometimes you're like, okay, that's great, I have these events flowing, but I want to be able to see what's going on. So you also use state machines in a way, but you use those state machines in a very different way by observing what's going on, correlating and matching this to a sequence so you can realize that you have higher level events going on. So a classic example in retail is, let's say you make a price update and suddenly the orders for this item go through the roof. That event might actually be called pricing mistake, right? There's likely something wrong, somebody forgot a comma or a zero, and you can notice that and give that the name of an event that you harvest from the other event. So very different ways, similar elements, but very different kind of architecture. Last element around this, event-driven architectures are great, but event-driven architectures also have very dynamic runtime properties. So this is straight from our website, right? We always wanna be very transparent and caution our customers, right? You can make things like infinite loops, right? If you have these events going everywhere, right? And you say, well, the address changed, and because the address changed, I need to reprice something, and because I'm repriced something, something in the address might change. Well, congratulations, you've just made an infinite loop. So the loose coupling that you gain at design time leads to a more dynamic runtime behavior and you need to be prepared to deal with that, right? So you need to have a system image, you need to have cost control, you need to have back pressure on your queues, right? You need to be able to prepare that this thing has more dynamic properties. And you can't complain a lot, to be quite honest, because you wanted those dynamic properties because that's why you made your system loosely coupled. If you don't need anything to be dynamic, well, go ahead and couple everything, you will be fine. So keep in mind that having a dynamic system is great, but also it puts more burden on you in terms of managing that. And then I have one minute for my very last topic. I'll be really quick before Eric takes me off stage. And that is, I talked a lot about architecture, right? I sort of hinted that the topic isn't new, but the technology is. There's things we can do now that we were not able to do 25 years ago, like instant provisioning, scaling, serverless, right? All these kind of things. So how does that influence how we deal with distributed and event-driven architectures. And one of my favorite topics there is automation. I often say if you take automation out of the cloud, you don't have a lot more than another data center. And nobody wanted another data center. So automation is really key of being cloud native if you want to use that word. So here's something very interesting. So I mostly live in serverless land because I find that sort of be the, the most prototypical way of building in the cloud. When you look at automation, serverless automation definitely isn't about provisioning because all the stuff is already provisioned and auto-provisioning, that's why it's serverless, right? There's also deployment is very easy or often there's nothing to deploy, right? I'm configuring my event bridge. Am I deploying? No, not really. It's already running, like that's the whole aspect of serverless. I don't need to deploy this thing. So mostly what I'm doing is I'm composing. I am wiring pieces together. Here's a Lambda, here's an SQS, here's an event bridge, here's a step functions, here's a DynamoDB, here's another Lambda. I'm putting pieces together. Now, if putting pieces together sounds like boxes and lines, you are spot on. And the way I like to describe this is when I look at these architectures, I had a little bit of fun of taking an example from my book from like 20 years ago. It's a little sort of loan broker. Somebody wants a loan and goes to the banks and gets some quotes and picks the best quote. What does this look like in a modern serverless architecture and what role does automation play? So when you implement a system like this, right? Now we're sort of fast forward, we are back in 2022. Here are the technologies that you would use to build such a system. You have a published subscribe channel, right? With SNS where you send the message to the different banks, the banks make their offers, right? You filter some of the offers and maybe there's some invalid responses. You filter the offers, you put them all on one channel and you aggregate them into, well, here is your best offer. Now. The thing that is really interesting about this is that this system image 
talks at three different levels of vocabulary. There's the business domain, right? Quotes, requests, um, banks, brokers, right? You're talking about business entities. You're also talking about distributed messaging pattern, filtering, aggregator, publish, subscribe, message channels. So that's another layer of vocabulary. And then, of course, you have the vocabulary of the system that you actually use to build that, and that's you know, the AWS serverless ecosystem. Now, the amazing thing that you can do with cloud automation is you can separate those and code your system along these three different levels because the infrastructure is programmable. And when we write programs, we want to make abstractions. Sometimes you want to talk about specific technologies, but sometimes you want to talk about banks and quotes and loan brokers. Oh, the first time I clicked the wrong direction, I knew this. There, yeah, you warned me. So, really quick, right? This is not a lesson about CDK, but I'm a huge fan of using CDK automation in this context when we build these kind of event-driven, these kind of message-oriented applications, because CDK allows me to do that in a regular programming language. So here's a line of code, like a total line of normal line of code, looks like any other line of code, but this is not application code, this is composition code. This is instantiating a bank, and it's telling the bank where the responses go. Remember all the different ways of connecting to systems? In this case, it's the name of a channel. It's the mortgage quote bus, something that my event bridge is listening to. And what I can do is I can start expressing the shape of my application, like the things I wire together, I can start expressing those in patterns and as code. I can talk about message filters and content filters. I can use an abstract vocabulary, but this is executable code that actually deploys and configures serverless infrastructure. And I find that this completely changes the way you think about it. It's no longer, I'm making my boxes and now I sort of need to do the lines, but the boxes and the lines, you both program them at the same time in the same language. And if you take that a few steps forward, right, you could be creating fluid APIs like this, like, oh, you know, build me something with a scatter gather, I filter some events out, I aggregate them based on a condition, and when you execute this code, you get a running system because the cloud is fully programmable. And that's where this thing is different than it used to be in 1995, that we are no longer doing the composition manually, the composition is all automated, so this whole discussion about what's in my boxes and how are these boxes wired together, both become a programming exercise. And that is a fundamental shift. So I can describe the intent of what I'm doing. I'm no longer talking sort of in lambdas and SQS, I'm describing the flow of my system, but I can do that in code as opposed to in documentation. So I mentioned I'm not gonna answer any questions, but I'm gonna contradict myself once. There's one question I answer. So in summary here, the whole event-driven story and all the nuances and the coupling, a lot of those topics stay with us and are very important for us as architects to understand. But the modern technology sort of shifts the way we can do this. This is no longer a paper exercise, this is now a coding exercise. You're coding your system's composition and in a way you're coding the coupling and that gives you the answer of what actually holds your loosely coupled application together. That is your automation code. The automation code is the one that makes the composition and that is defining how your application holds together even though you made everything loosely coupled. So I hope that inspired you for today's talk and have enough questions in your head, so please ask those to all the other speakers. They'll be highly delighted. Um, if you enjoyed this, many resources for you, right? Serverless Land, my website, the books, right? So tons of other stuff you can use to continue the conversation. I'll be around for most of the day, so find me and chat and have an awesome day with EDA Day. Thank you.